Good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys this morning. I want to look right into the camera before we get started and welcome in our family over at the North Campus and everybody watching online and traveling for Memorial Day. Can we give them a great big round of applause? We love you. We love you. You are our family. We're glad that you are with us this morning. And uh, another thing I want to mention before we move on is that it is Memorial Day weekend. And so I just want to take a minute and encourage you to remember what this weekend is about and why we get time off and why we celebrate is because people have gone before us and given their lives for our freedom, including our freedom to worship today that we're getting to do. And so I want to encourage you not to just pass this weekend by without, one, being grateful for that and thinking about that, but two, I want to encourage you to take time to pray, either today or tomorrow, over the families of those who have lost loved ones who've sacrificed their lives for us because they paid a, a dear price for our freedom. And so I want to encourage you to take time to pray for them, either today or tomorrow, and remember them, okay? All right, so we're in a series today uh, called Shadow Step. We are continuing this series on uh, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. It's based on the theme verse in Galatians 5.25 that says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so last week we talked about who is the Holy Spirit, kind of understand who he is, that he's not weird, he's not spooky. People are weird. The Holy Spirit's not weird. And maybe some people have thought he was weird because of a presentation that they've seen of him and he's like that's not me and so uh he's not he's not weird we learned last week that he's a person that he helps us to think as god thinks desire what god desires and, and uh to know what god wants us to do for our lives and he also is god he is not a distant cousin to god he is god and we learned that uh he is our helper for our everyday lives he to come alongside us and that he is our friend and so i pray that you uh, if you haven't heard that message, I want to encourage you to go back to understand that he wants to be your friend. He wants to be with you every day uh, to be your helper. And so we learned about that last week. Something I thought was kind of interesting, I didn't know until last Saturday, and I forgot to mention it last Sunday, but last Sunday was uh, Pentecost Sunday. I don't know if you guys knew this. And Pentecost Sunday is the celebration or the commemoration of when uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2. And he came then, and, and Pentecost only means 50th, and so it was a celebration of the 50th day after Easter, or Jesus raised from the dead, and it was a commemoration of that. And I thought it was kind of interesting, we didn't plan it this way, but we started a series on the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday, so it wasn't something that we thought about or plan, planned on doing, but I just thought that was cool how that uh, worked out. So today I want to talk to you about being filled with the Spirit, or the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I've got, I'm just going to give you a heads up, I've got a lot of scriptures, and there was way more that I had to cut out, and I'm just letting you know if you're taking notes, uh, good luck. Um, but it will also be, it'll also be on version. it'll also be online later, you can get it later today as well on our website. But I'm telling you that not because I'm trying to cram just a bunch of scripture in here to have a bunch of scripture, although that's not a bad thing, right, to preach the word of God. But because the Holy Spirit is all throughout scripture. And I just want you to see how much he's in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, the, the Word of God was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so he's all throughout. So uh, there's a lot of scripture today. I want to start in Hebrews chapter 6, 1 and 2. And this is where we get our essentials class. Uh, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms. And it goes on to talk about different foundational principles of the gospel. And this is what we teach in our essentials class. Many of you have heard of it. Many of you have taken it. It's a nine-week course that covers what you see here, the elementary principles of Christ. These are the foundations of our faith. And I bring this verse up because I want you to see that it says, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural. So there are more than one baptism. There's three baptisms that we're going to talk about about today that are doctrinal to our faith, and those are the baptism in salvation, the baptism in water, and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those three baptisms today. And before we get into it, I want to define baptism for you just so you get an understanding when I say that, what we're talking about. Baptism uh, just means to be submersed or submersion or immersion, to be immersed into and it reminded me a few years ago, a friend of mine, uh, Mario, called me up on a Thursday night. He's one of my best friends. And he's like, hey, God's telling me I need to get baptized tomorrow. And I was like, tomorrow? And he's like, yes, I, I can't wait any longer. I need to get baptized tomorrow. So we had Friday morning 
prayer back then. And so after Friday morning prayer, he came and we filled up our baptistry here. Now, it takes hours to fill up this baptistry. So we didn't have hours to wait. It also takes hours to warm up. And so it was cold outside and we were running out of time because we had to get to work. So we got about knee deep and we were like, okay, that's probably good enough. Now, if you don't know Mario, Mario looks like my bodyguard. In fact, I went to Mexico with him one time and people asked if he was my bodyguard. And I was like, no, he's just, he's just my friend. So, well, we, I caught this on video and, and I want to show you and then I want to tell you what I mean by it. Look, take a look at this video, me, me trying to baptize Mario. Mario will baptize you in the name of the Father. Come on, push him down. Push him down. Push him down. Yeah. He was fighting me. Yeah. I was pulling him up. All right, so I need to, I feel the need to clarify a few things here, okay? First of all, it was knee deep water, okay? So that was really hard. So I was thinking, I got to get him back up so don't go too far. I don't know, you couldn't hear him, but he said, I didn't go all the way under. So he was pulling himself back down while I was trying to pull him up. And it was already a big task, but he was fighting me. And I was like, what's going on? Now, I show you that one because it's, it's pretty funny, you know, to, to see me struggle to do that. But Mario understood the importance of being fully immersed. He didn't want any part of him not covered. He was like, I, I'm, I want to go all the way under. I want to be completely immersed into. So when we talk about these three baptisms, I want you to understand that it's going all the way in, be completely immersed into each one of these baptisms. So when we say that, just say immersion into, to be completely submerged or immersed into, to understand that. So the first one is the baptism in salvation. This is very foundational. This is being saved. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So as many of you as were immersed into Christ have put on Christ. Now that word put on there, I love the word picture there. It is in duo in the Greek and it means to be clothed, to put on like clothing. So you're, you're actually, when you are baptized into salvation or into the body of Christ, you are putting on Christ. You are going fully in, being submerged into a life of, with the body of Christ. So that word to put on or to clothe is a great word picture, but it's the immersion into Jesus. It's the immersion into salvation. And that is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually baptizes you into Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. It is the Holy Spirit who immerses us into the body of Christ. Remember last week we talked in John 16 about the work of the Holy Spirit was one of the, one of the things that he does is that he convicts us of sin and our need for Jesus. So baptism into salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us into Jesus. And that is the first and most foundational baptism. That's the baptism of salvation. And then there's the baptism in water. This is the natural progression. This is the next step for the believer. You saw this, my attempt with Mario. Uh, but this happens every first Wednesday for us at our communion service. Where we come together and we watch people make a public uh, display of what's happening inwardly for them. And you can read about water baptism all throughout scripture, but I'll just show you one here in Acts 2, uh, verses 40 through 41. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word, that means they were saved, were baptized. The next step was to be baptized into water. Now, water baptism does not save you. It, it, is, it is not required for salvation. It is the next step for the believer after salvation. And we see this progression all throughout scripture. It is a burying of your old nature. It is a cutting off of the old uh, that happened at salvation. So water baptisms, we like to say it's an outward expression of the inward transformation that's happening. It's going public basically and saying, listen, I, I'm burying this old man. I want everybody to know I'm going to be raised to new life. It's the burial and the resurrection into new life after being saved, after the baptism in salvation. And this is the second step for the believer in their journey. This is the very next thing you need to do if you've been saved. So that's water baptism. Then there's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about today, the baptism in 
the Holy Spirit. Now, remember I told you at the beginning that it is the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into Jesus, uh, and then uh, it is Jesus then that baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. It's cool how they all work together like that, but look here in Matthew 3, 11. It says, this is John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He, being Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's saying Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now you see here, I, I mentioned the other Four, uh, the other three places in the Gospels where this is mentioned. This is in all four Gospels. Uh, you can read about it in Mark uh, 1, Luke 3, and John 1 as well because I want you to see that it is Jesus that baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was our example, though, right? On this earth, he's the guy that we look at and say, okay, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? And Jesus was our, uh, our example. Now, Jesus did not have to be baptized into salvation. He didn't need to be born again because he was born perfect. He was born without sin. We're born into sin, so we need to be born again. We, we need the baptism in salvation. But Jesus didn't need that. However, Jesus was water baptized. We know John the Baptist baptized Jesus into water. And when he brought Jesus out of the water, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him and rested upon him and remained. John 1.33 says he remained on him. So Jesus was baptized in water and the Holy Spirit. Now, I think that's important that if Jesus needed to be baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit while on this earth, we also need those two baptisms while on this earth. And that marked really the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. When the Holy Spirit came and rested upon him, it was for his earthly ministry. And this is the progression of believers in the New Testament. We, you can see this all throughout Acts. I have one here I want to show you in Acts chapter 19, if you're turning in your scriptures, you can turn to Acts 19. You can also read of a similar instance in Acts 8 and also in Acts 10. But uh, in Acts 19, we see that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate experience than the baptism in salvation. It is different than the baptism in salvation. There's three different baptisms, each an experience that we need as believers. Look at Acts 19, 1 through 5. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. So he he come across these people who were, had already believed in Jesus. And he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so he had to like fact check them for a minute. He said to them, into what then were you baptized? And so they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is Christ Jesus when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So that was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You can read about this also in Acts 8. It's another great example. When believers, when people had been saved, they had been baptized, and then Peter and John came along and found out that they had not been filled with the Holy Spirit yet. So he prayed for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's another, a separate experience, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So the three baptisms, salvation, water, and the Holy Spirit. And I want to show you a scripture where they're all in one, because I think this is a really cool scripture. John, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. It says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, the Word is another name for Jesus. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is referred to as the Word. So he's saying, In heaven... There are three that agree as one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're, they're, that's the Trinity we spoke about last week. Remember we said that the Holy Spirit is God. Here's further scriptures to show you that the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son, and they agree in heaven. Then he says, and then there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree as one. Now the blood is salvation. It, it, Jesus had to shed his blood for our salvation. For salvation, there had to be a shedding of blood. So he's saying on the earth, there are these three that agree in one, salvation, water, and the Holy Spirit. These are the three baptisms on earth that are three separate experiences or occurrences that agree as one. They're all for the believer. Amen. And I think that's a beautiful passage there. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, we see that in the Old Testament, there was a type and a shadow of these three baptisms that we see about in the New Testament. Look here in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2. 
Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. Now, let me explain that to you. Moses was a type of Christ. He was not Jesus. He was not Christ. But he was a type in that he was a deliverer. He saved the children of Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt, right? So he was a type of deliverer, a type of Christ. So he's saying they were baptized into Moses, into water, being they parted the Red Sea. He wa they walked through the Red Sea. That's a type of baptism. And then the cloud. Now, if you remember in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were, le were led by a cloud by day and fire by night, and that is the Holy Spirit. Those are picture of the Holy Spirit. So they were baptized into the three in the Old Testament as a type of what was coming in the New Testament. The water, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So those are the three baptisms. Now, why, why is this important? Why is it important to understand these three baptisms? Okay, so when you get baptized into salvation, when you come to know Jesus, the Bible says that you become a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? We are new creations in Christ. The old has passed away, the new has come. So you are born again. Your old nature dies. And then when you get water baptized, when you get baptized in water, it's a burying of that old nature. It's saying, okay, now that you, this guy's died, I'm gonna bury this in the waters of baptism. And then when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you receive power from heaven to walk in the new creation you are on earth. So these three baptisms are very important for each believer on this earth. Jesus made actually a pretty big deal with the disciples about waiting until the Holy Spirit came before they went out to do their earthly ministry. Look here in Acts chapter 1. This is one instance when Jesus, after he had been raised from the dead, he was appearing to people. In fact, he just appeared to the disciples in a room that was locked. He kind of scared them. But in this instance, Acts 1, 4 through 5, it says, On one occasion... While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, listen, I don't want you to go anywhere yet. I know we, we have work to do on this earth, but don't go anywhere. Don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. He placed a pretty big importance on this. Look at Luke 24 through uh, 2449 it says I am going to send you what my father has promised this is Jesus speaking but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high that's a beautiful word picture again he's saying wait until you've been clothed with power from on high that's that same word clothed that we read about earlier to put on Christ it's the exact same word in duo in the Greek it means to put on to be immersed in to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit is for your earthly good. The Holy Spirit is so that you can accomplish what I put you on this earth to accomplish. You, you are to receive power from on high. Don't go anywhere yet until you get that. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. Look at Acts 1.8. Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit is for power on this earth to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. That's why we teach a class called Spirit Empowered Living. Because as believers, we are to live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need that power from on high. Jesus placed a high importance on it to his disciples who were gonna go change the world. He's like, you can't do this until you have the Holy Spirit. You need to be clothed with power from on high. So one thing I like to say is, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to make a difference on this earth. We don't just need the power of the Holy Spirit to be a bold witness with by sharing our faith, although that's what comes. You will be emboldened or empowered to have courage to share your faith, but you will also receive boldness and power and courage to live your faith. Amen. Not just to share it with your mouth, but to live a lifestyle that is a witness to who Jesus is and his power in our lives. So that's what the power of the Holy Spirit is for. We need that power. We, we look for it. We want that power. We want to feel supernatural. And if we don't get it from the Holy Spirit, we're going to look for it somewhere else. Look at Ephesians 5, 17 and 18. And I read you Ephesians 5, 18 last week, but I, I want to read it to you today in this translation. It says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. I like that. Instead, 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, listen, what, what do people call alcohol? Liquid courage, right? People get drunk to, to, to try to get courage or boldness or to lose their inhibitions to do something they wouldn't normally do. They, 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 they try to receive power from something like this. That's why they call alcohol a spirit. So he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit because I know you're searching for some sort of power and it's not to be found in this. It's to be found in the Holy Spirit. And remember that word filled we talked about last week means to be full or complete or fulfilled, not drunk. In fact, he says, don't act thoughtlessly. Don't act crazy. Think straight. Think clearly. The Holy Spirit will help you to do that because he goes on to say, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. The Holy Spirit will help you to understand what the Lord wants you to do, what God's will is for your life. The power that you receive from him is to accomplish that will on this earth. That's why we need a continual filling. There is an experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's for every believer, but every day I wake up asking the Holy Spirit to fill me. Fill me today. Empty me of me, Holy Spirit. I don't want any of me left in me. I want all of you. So fill me today with power from on high. And I encourage you to pray that same prayer and watch the difference it makes in your life. Now, you might have noticed at the end of Acts 19, that passage I read, after he had laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that they spoke with tongues and prophesied. You can see this also in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, they all spoke with tongues. And I know that this word tongues or praying in the spirit has put some people off. They're like, I don't understand that. I don't know what that means. This has caused a lot of mystery around who the Holy Spirit is or the result of the Holy Spirit in your life. And tongues is a result or a benefit of the Holy Spirit being in your life, the power of the Holy Spirit. But people have said, well, that's not normal. That's not natural. And they're right. It's not normal and it's not natural. It's supernatural. Amen. So we're not called to just be normal and natural. Amen. I don't want to be normal. I need to be supernatural to accomplish what God has called me to do on this earth. It's not a natural thing. It's very supernatural. And we've put it off because we can't understand it. We don't understand what that means. So I want to tell you two things that, you're, that praying in the spirit or praying with tongues does. And first thing I want you to understand is it's to God. Amen. Praying in the spirit is to God. Praying with tongues is to God. It is not to man. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Paul says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So we have to understand it's to God, not men. Otherwise, we'll be trying to figure out what we're saying. We don't understand it. It is not a language to men. It's a language to God. And it's very biblical. You can see it all throughout the Bible. In fact, Romans 8, 26 tells us we don't even know how to pray without the Holy Spirit. He prays for us or makes intercession through us with groanings we can't understand. It is a spiritual language. It's not meant for human understanding. So the Bible is clear that we don't have to have understanding on this. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around people who speak another language. I, I've traveled the world and been in churches with people that I don't understand what they're saying. They're worshiping in another language. I have no idea what they're saying. They're praying in another language. I don't have any idea what they're saying. But I'm telling you, the power and the presence of God is there, and I can feel it. Somehow we think it's okay if we don't understand that, and the power of God shows up. But if we're praying and we don't understand it, that's weird. But the power and the presence of God comes when you begin to speak in a language which the Holy Spirit gives you. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. This whole chapter is on tongues. Paul says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, I don't understand what I'm saying. It's unfruitful for me to try to think about what I'm saying. My spirit is praying. So what's the conclusion then, he says? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. He's saying just because I don't understand it doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. I don't have to do it. I don't have to understand it. I can do both. I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. And sometimes we think, well, if I begin to pray in the Spirit, I'm going to have no control, and I'm just going to be praying in tongues nonstop, and I don't know what that means. No, you don't lose control. He's saying you have the choice. You can pray in the Spirit. You can pray with understanding. Amen. It's not like driving a car with no brakes, and you're just going to be like, oh, please, let me stop. That's not going to happen to you, okay? You're not going to just lose control of yourself, but you can't understand yourself. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak 
through you. So you have a choice in this. And I love it. He said, I, what's my conclusion? If I can't understand it, should I just give up on it? No, I'm going to do both. I'm going to pray with the Spirit and I'm going to pray with understanding. I'm going to sing with the Spirit and I'm going to sing with understanding. So the first thing we have to understand about that language is that it's to God. It's not to men. It's not for other people. It's for God. It's to God. So the second thing I want you to understand is that it builds you up. Praying in the Spirit builds you up. Look at Jude one twenty. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. It's how we build our faith. You get built up when you begin to pray in the Spirit. Your spirit man is encouraged. Look at 1 Corinthians 14.4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Edifies means to build up or to encourage. But he who prophesies edifies the church. He's saying tongues or praying in the Spirit is for your own personal edification. It is, a, it is a prayer language for you. Now he goes on in this chapter to talk about the public versus the private use and that if there are tongues in public, there should always be an interpretation. But his, his point in this is saying, I would rather you prophesy in public because that's a language other people understand. That builds up the church. But when you pray in the Spirit, it will edify and encourage and build you up. That is a, it is for your benefit that you pray in the Spirit. It's for your benefit that you use this language. Now, when I was younger, and I remember I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, my neighbors that live right next to us, they, uh, they found out that our church was Spirit-filled, and they, one day we were riding bikes, and they were like, hey, you speak in tongues? And I was like, uh, yeah. And I can still see them, three bikes in front of me, and they lean in, they're like, do it. You know, like I was just gonna, like it, they wanted to see a show, and I was like, no, it's not a show. That's not what this is for. You know, this is a personal language to God. It, it builds me up. And, and it's, not, it's not something for public to just be like, let me just show you what I can do. That's not what this is, okay? It's not a show. But I'll tell you that when I pray in the Spirit at home, I'll be praying in the Spirit. I'll be praying in understanding. I'll be, I, my faith is incredibly built up. I just begin to feel the power in the presence of God. And when I don't understand what I'm saying, I don't have to. But what happens, what eventually will happen is, is the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal things to me. I'll get clarity on things I've been praying for. I'll get words of wisdom for things I'm doing in my job or, or for other people because the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me. I pray in my spirit and I pray in my understanding. Now for the Christian, that should be a very normal thing. It's not normal to the world. It's not natural, but we're not natural beings. We're supernatural beings, and we need power from on high to live the life that God called us to live, and that is the benefit of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Paul even goes so far in 1 Corinthians 14, 18 to say, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. He wasn't bragging. He was saying, it's not weird. I'm telling you, I do it. I do it more than anybody. And then he goes on to say, I wish you all spoke in tongues in verse 5. And that's my heart for you. I wish you all had the prayer language with the power of the Holy Spirit because you're missing out on something very powerful in your life to build you up, to encourage you, to hear the Holy Spirit speak to you and through you. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Spirit is a gift that we have to receive. Why would you not want everything that God has for you? Why would you not want everything that the Holy Spirit has for you if Jesus says, I don't want you to go out and do anything until you've received the Holy Spirit? He's a gift. Look at Acts 2, 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off as to many as the Lord God would call. He's a gift that has to be received. But I, the reason I chose this verse is because I want you to see he was not just for those people back then. He said he's a promise to you, to your children, and to all those who are far off. That's us. We were far off from God. Now we've been brought close to God. And the Holy Spirit is a gift for us today. He's a gift for you if you will receive him. And the focus is on receiving. You always see when Jesus said, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's not going to force him on us. We have to receive him. You can only do two things with a gift that are offered to you. You can receive it or you can reject it. You can receive the gift or you can say, no thanks, I don't want this gift, right? So he's a gift that we have to receive. It's not about you making something happen. It's not about you working anything up. 
It's about you getting past your understanding and saying, I don't understand this, and saying, you know what? If this is a gift God has for me, I want this gift. It's a good gift. Look, look here in Luke 11, 11 through 13, and I'll close with this scripture. It says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? He's a good gift. And he's saying, listen, if your kids ask you for an egg, you're not going to throw a scorpion on their plate and be like, gotcha, wanted a good gift. No, no we know how to give good gifts, and we're evil. We're not near as We're nothing compared to God, right? So how much more, he's saying, would he give you a good and great gift in the Holy Spirit? He's a good gift. He's not a trick. We're not going to ask God for a good gift and God be like, gotcha, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit instead. No, he's saying, no, he's a good gift, but you have to receive him. You have to ask, is what he said. How much more will your father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? Now, I don't know about you, but I want everything that God has for me. I want everything the Holy Spirit has for me. And I pray that that's your prayer today as well. So what I want us to do is I want us to stand at both campuses uh, and I want that, the prayer team to go ahead and begin to make their way down at the North Campus as well. Prayer team, go ahead and come down. And North Campus, your campus pastor is going to lead you from here. But here today at the South Campus, we've been hearing about the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Maybe today, as I was speaking, you were listening to the Word of God. Maybe today you're saying, you know what, I've never experienced that third baptism. I've never had a separate experience in receiving and asking for the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And today may be your day for that. And I'm going to pray for you in a minute. And when I pray, after I pray, I want you just to come down when I dismiss. And and these people at the altar are prayed up and ready to lead you in receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. They, They want to do that with you today. So if that's you, don't leave here today without receiving the good gift of the Holy Spirit. But you have to ask. You may have identified yourself as that today. Today, you may have said, you know what? I I actually have never done the second step in water baptism. I've never made that second step to go and say, you know what? I want to bury this old man. And the Holy Spirit may be drawing your heart today to say, that's your next step, to be baptized in water. And and you too can come down after the service and tell each one of these people, hey, listen, I want to be water baptized. And they'll help you get on the list. That's coming up at the first Wednesday of the next month in June. We can do that here. So don't leave today without making that decision. Or you might be here today and you might just say, you know what? I'm ready to go all in with Jesus. I've never gone all in. I've never been fully immersed into the body of Christ. And today is your day of salvation. If that's you, you may say, you know what? I want to go all in. I want to be fully immersed into his body. So today you can also come down and pray with any one of these people after I pray for you. But don't leave here today without making sure that you're following the natural progression of believers in the New Testament water baptism, to be saved, to be water baptized, and to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit for your natural life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you didn't leave us abandoned on this earth, that you didn't just leave us to figure it out. You gave us the Holy Spirit. You are a good father, and you know how to give good gifts. He is our guide. He's our helper. He's our friend. So I pray today, Lord, for those that you are drawing in any one of these baptisms, God, that you begin to speak to their heart right now. That we would be able to live a life full of the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish everything that you have for us on this earth, God. That we would be witnesses to you. I'm just so grateful for your Holy Spirit today. I thank you for that. And as I finish praying, I want to pray this prayer over you that I read last week in 1 Corinthians 13, 14. I want to pray, God, that the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God in the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Well, listen, you, you are dismissed. But I want to encourage you, please don't leave. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit or get water baptized or come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ today, come and give prayer. You are dismissed. You can get prayer for anything else today too. Uh, You need healing, financial, marriage, anything, come down and get prayer. Don't leave today with a need, amen? God bless you guys. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week.